army people because army people are you know we are a little brash and we have a little uh, our exteriors are so <laughs> very awkward but when you come across personalities like professor madran you feel very happy to sit back and listen so i would have actually preferred to sit back and listen to him rather than come in and speak myself but nevertheless thank you so much for welcoming me so warmly it was a pleasure that i came there the last time on the 1st of october I spoke my heart out. I think I spoke almost two hours that day, and the governor did not leave that day. If you remember, His Excellency did not leave. He had come to hear me for forty minutes and stayed on for two and a half hours at the end of it. So it's a pleasure to be back with you. And uh, this couldn't have happened at a better time because we are really moving through some very very tumultuous times. And I'm so glad that uh, everyone seems to be so aware and so. Keen to know things, uh, I had no idea that while I was speaking to Shreya Dondial on CNN News 18, I didn't know that Professor Markran was listening and watching at the other end. And uh, I was spelling out basically my essentially my ground knowledge of that place. Uh, very happy to tell you that I commanded my battalion in Siachen Glacier, and after de-inducting from Siachen, I came and brought my battalion to Eastern Ladakh. So I was all along the Shok River. And I came to a place called Tangse, and from Tangse to the to the Pengongso Lake, to Chushul, Demchok. This entire area was uh, with me at that particular time. Those were not very dangerous times as today, as they are. Uh, that time, Siachen was much more dangerous. So that is the reason why I can bring. When you have ground knowledge and you have that experience, and you have commanded at higher levels in different other areas, you can actually apply your mind to this and come out with holistic. Uh, Thoughts on what, how this whole thing can pan out. One of the things I did tell um, the the anchor today was that I'm not expecting any results tomorrow. A lot of people in India think that tomorrow, the sixth of June, General Harinder Singh will go there and have a meeting, and uh, everything will be hunky dory. Nothing of the sort. It's going to be a long haul. I, I can assure you, it's going to be a fairly long. Haul. But then I'll come to that separately. So we are going to be speaking primarily about India, the post-COVID world, and the China. This is virtually divided out into two parts, but uh, but very very closely linked to each other. Such a complex subject, the whole world seems to be undergoing a change, and this always happens, uh, you know, when when uh, these kind of events take place. In 1918, the First World War came to an end, and the world was hit by a pandemic, the Spanish flu. Most people don't remember that between 50 to 70 million people died in the world. In India, between 12 and 17 million people died. Most people cannot recall this, obviously, and we had no system of keeping statistics and computerized data and things like that. So obviously, much of it was lost. The figures could have been much higher. And it's 100 years later that we are being hit. Uh, in 1922, they had a A Washington at a World Naval Conference in Washington, attended by nine nations, and they couldn't come to any consensus on how exactly to manage the various naval assets which had been constructed during the First World War, and the failure, you know, the end of the First World War, the coming of the pandemic, the Treaty of Versailles, 1919, the Washington Treaty, 1922, which did not come to any consensus. All this resulted. In actually, the creation of the economic conditions which led to the finally to the Great Depression in 1929, and the only the only organization, the only nation, and the only personality who benefited from this whole thing was our friend Hitler, and that is how 21 years after the end of the First World War, the world was at war again. So, this is how events come together. 2020, I'm not saying events are coming together. Next major event, 1945, of course, was there. 1989, if you look at it, 1989, the Cold War came to an end, right? But another kind of a war started, a war against Islam, Islam against the rest of the world, and you found that almost a clash of civilizations taking place, the rise of China, and uh, Sino-U.S. Uh, rivalry, which took over the world completely, and for the better part, and then the global war on terror after 21, after 9/11. So these are some of the events which have come together in these years, and uh, brought the world to a very dangerous stage at many times. And now in 2020, we have come to a stage 
where one of the one of the worst pandemics seems to be we are still in the middle of the pandemic by the way so we can hardly talk about the post covid world we are still in the middle of the of the pandemic itself so but we need to apply our mind a lot to how the post covid world will be now my emphasis is going to be more on geopolitics less on economics because there are many more involved people who will be able to tell us something about economics perhaps more on and less on social sciences there will be a there has to be a tremendous effect on social sciences so um, uh, why you may feel that i am a little centered towards geopolitics your strategy uh, international security and things like that uh, hold your horses you will find that there is a lot for everyone in this in this presentation so let me go ahead right let us remember internal management of how countries are doing internal management of the uh, pandemic is primarily through three things public health the management of economy and social harmony international management includes all this plus it may handle means the handling of the pandemic on an international level plus the control of geopolitics that's a very important thing you can't really control geopolitics they pan out in the manner that they wish to. The internal management is a very important aspect because these three factors interplay with each other. The more you, the more you pay attention to public health, the less your economy is likely to improve. As you are seeing this whole issue of the lockdown versus uh, opening up. Social harmony, inevitably developing countries will have major problems like we've had with the an unrealized issue like the migrant labor millions of them who were living in hovels in different parts of the of the, of the country in different urban centers without us really realizing how deeply involved they were in the running of india's economy the entire economy was actually actually depend, depending on these workers and now the manner in which they are being attracted back by different corporate companies by different organizations people are sending aircraft to bring them back and things like that one of the other things which is uh, what you're going to see is that many of the old conflicts seem to be dampening for suddenly you find uh, iran is down you find west asia middle east suddenly the one of the most potent areas of the world the last three or four years has suddenly drawn down and others are reviving you may even find, for example, the Ukraine, the conflict in Ukraine, Eastern Europe, etc. These are also the Afghan conflict. The Afghan conflict uh, seems to be, well, neither here, neither there. It, is, it, it isn't uh, ramping up in any very big way, although you had certain incidents, even as the uh, pandemic uh, has been on. But some other old conflicts are reviving, probably. Taiwan, the issue of Taiwan is reviving. The sino indian uh, entire uh, i'm not calling it a conflict yet but side the sino indian standoff is definitely creating flutters in the rest of the world uh, this is something which we'll have to keep addressing as we go along because these are unrealized areas we all thought that the himalayan front is after doklam um after after the informal summits attended by prime minister modi uh, and the president xi jinping that we are probably got a measure of all this it's not so vaccine politics but that's a very important terminology the world is looking for a for a vaccine india is coming to arrangements with the different countries i think with oxford university particularly the oxford research center for one billion vials of whatever vaccine will ultimately come out um whoever develops a a effective vaccine will have power in his hands there's no doubt it is like having the longevity pill virtually so uh, you will find that uh, there's a there's a huge hue and cry for this everyone is going into deeply into 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 uh, research and development on on in, in the field of medicine and ventilators uh, vaccine itself and all kinds of things like this like so you are going to find in the near future that power will be dictated in the next few years by the search for the vaccine isolationism and deglobalization deglobalization was already on the way the united states was already getting becoming isolationist it was uh, looking inwards much more it was looking at america first and the whole concept of a whole globalized economy the flat world etc uh, seemed to have been dwindling at that time even before the pandemic now it seems that uh, greater isolationism 
may emerge at least temporarily because it will take some time to realize that ultimately globalization is the only way forward supply chains can only remain um, within within bounds of prices and things like that and then cost uh, being remaining cost effective as such only if you find a uh, sharing around the world the globalized model of particularly of china uh, seemed to have been very effective at one time but then the rest of the world has been looking at it in the sense that india has a, a huge uh, trade deficit with, with china today so everyone is looking more at isolationism atmanirbhata this is what we are looking at self sufficiency we are virtually going back to the socialist period you know in our outlook this is what we used to talk about in nehru's time the, the the whole aspect of swaraj and things like that this is what exactly we are coming back to so for some time the world is definitely going to go more isolationist and it will have its effects uh, on on the geopolitical side there is going to be a the resetting of a new world order this always happens it happened after the first world war it happened after the second world war it happened after the cold war and uh, this time again definitely a new world order and we need to understand what this new world order is likely to be of course new world orders are not always um, you know institutionally put together many of them emerge through various factors and 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 uh, and uh, you know uh, different influences which take place from time to time but i i put it together in one way to see that the the the, the whole of, of uh, the entire um, uh, influence of different uh, issues coming together may look something like may look something like this sure i got a sorry um may look something like this firstly an institutional oversight you will have the united nations you got regional groups like the european union asean and apec and things like that you got economic blocks and things like that um they will remain they will remain how how strong how powerful the united nations if you remember after the cold war suddenly emerged very strong particularly in the domain of peacekeeping here suddenly you find the the entire concept of the un particularly with the un with the us pull out i have to just put off my phone i'm so sorry just an so sorry yeah um so um you found the un extremely strong at that particular time in 1989-90 uh you find the world health organization and the american pull out of the world health organization obviously um the un's uh, the un's uh, overall reputation etc seems to be at stake at, at the moment so it will have it will play its role how far how long is the question market forces globalization currencies that's someone from the economic side to really explain to us what the power of the dollar and uh, the whole the whole international economy resting on uh, the dollar this is something which is going to be challenged to a very great extent as we go along although i don't think we are still at that stage where the where china can really challenge the united states the united states is still very far ahead and much that we will say we will talk about it much that people may say that this is the end of the america and the united states will be a, a second rate uh, international power etc i don't entirely agree with that i think the mismatch or the, the distance between china and the us is still very very huge you will have cartels oil energy weapons after all the united states economy has been built up on weapons and the sale of weapons is something with and uh, so will people have will nations have the money to buy weapons that is the question and us uh, defense industry is the is an engine by itself which drives the uh, us economy you see what has happened with russia and saudi arabia in fact many say it's the united states which managed to get saudi arabia to actually ensure that the price of oil through uh, not having an agreement on the limits of production or the bottom line in terms of minimum production etc were never agreed to with the russians and as a result of that the prices have really crashed it came down to 19 dollars a barrel came down to negative pricing at one time if you remember and that is actually affecting the russian economy 
in a very big way. So uh, much that the Russians were trying to interfere through gray zone warfare in the United States internal politics, you find the Rus Americans have been able to hit back. And you will see much of this kind of a gray zone warfare which will continue for quite some time. Uh, you will find technology. Mostly such periods always throw up technologies in a very big way. You found the First World War throw up, throw up aviation and submarine warfare in a very big way. Uh, the Cold War, post-1945, the post-Cold War, now most people may think I'm really joking. The internet actually was nothing but the creation for ensuring the networking of the United States Armed Forces placed in different parts of the world. That is how the internet actually came up. All the information highways that were created, the research work which went on for that created the internet. So you're going to look at robotics in a very big way. You're going to look at artificial intelligence. There's no doubt that that is the domain at the moment. Data management, deep data uh, mining which should take place, uh, big data management itself, social media. We haven't even seen the beginning of social media. I think the kind of social media we are going to see and if you, are, if you as a nation have not seen the value of, of uh, social media, we are only seeing Netflix at the moment and we are only seeing uh, Amazon at the moment and things like that. But if you really see the way China is uh, exploiting this domain as a part of its uh, warfare strategies, and we talk about it subsequently. I have not mentioned it here, but before I come to balance of power, I thought I must mention to you that is a very important aspect, and that is that uh, I don't think the world is going to be seeing war fighting of a conventional kind for some time. Because it's a very expensive thing, you know, but to, to go in and fight a, a war in the Gulf, Gulf War One, Gulf War Two. Um, although Afghanistan has really not been a conventional war, but the beginning, the first part of it was. Uh, the Americans have spent something to the tune of $3 trillion in Afghanistan. They spent a trillion dollars in, in Iraq. It's a hugely exp expensive thing to look at expeditionary uh, wars being fought away from your homeland somewhere. So this is something which is going to be of the past. So when this happens, when you find that conventional wars take a, a backstage, you find new forms of warfare will come up. And I would recommend to you to sometimes study Google or nothing else, Look at it briefly. Gray zone warfare, hybrid warfare, the combination of the spectrums of warfare together. Every one of you is a warrior. Right? The world is coming to such a stage where every one of you is a warrior. Every academic is a warrior. Because you are fighting in some way or the other for your nation. And this is what the future of warfare is going to be. Balance of power. I'll talk about balance of power in a separate slide as I come along. Are the effect on, on global war on terror? Will the world have the necessary focus and attention after this, after the downturn in economies? Will they be able to spend that kind of money? Other campaigns, the campaigns that the Russians are fighting in Ukraine, one of the, one of the world's um, ongoing hybrid warfare campaigns, can the Russians continue to fight it? The Chinese, can they continue with their campaign in the South China Sea? Can they continue with their campaign? Can they continue with the... Belt and Road Initiative itself, it seems they can because they seem to be very uppity about the whole. And of course, the development indices will indicate a lot. The China, China's BRI, which I just mentioned, freedom of navigation. This is one of, one of the major things which is going to be there. It was already an issue before. It is going to become another issue subsequently. Uh, the seas are supposed to be completely free for everyone besides the 12-mile the, uh, uh, areas which you have around your, your, your shores, you have complete freedom for navigation. But some nations always prefer to have a control over this. So this is, that is the way that you can always throttle another nation, preventing it from having the freedom to navigate through a particular area. That means a country like China, for example. If it does not have the freedom of navigation through the Indian Ocean, what will happen to it? It can't take its... Uh, oil or energy resources from the Middle East all the way to the eastern coast and it cannot bring its manufactured completed goods through the Straits of Malacca back to the markets in India, in Europe, in West Asia or in Africa. 80% of that container traffic comes from here. I'll explain that to you on a map subsequently. So this is another area. What is, a, what is it going to be? Balance of power? 
balance of power as i explained it is a uh, going to balance of power has a lot of lot of issues in it i explained that separately to you but let me tell you what will international geopolitics be all about everyone is talking about a weakened us and uh, i consider it very very debatable although what you're seeing in the united states today is a very temporary thing 40 cities are burning at the moment after george lloyd's uh, murder virtual murder 40 um, cities are burning and uh, lots of people are saying the president trump is down by nine percentage points as far as the national uh, figures are concerned at the moment but five months is a long period you've got three months four months to 4th of november 5th of november or the 8th of november when the elections are going to be held so we've got about about four and a half months or so uh, a lot of things can change in that but the united states whichever way it is is definitely going to come out weakened but yet probably retain the, the capability to make a major difference continue to make a major difference in the world too many people are writing of the united states and thinking that uh, the russian china combined has now taken the it, 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 has, it has become the preeminent organization china now this is this is a careful thing to listen china is squirming i chose that term particularly squirming it's got a major image deficit it's got a victim syndrome the image deficit comes out from things like what's happening in hong kong its inability to integrate taiwan its inability to pressurize the united states as far as the trade war which is going on uh doclam which was also a part of his image deficit there are lots of things which have happened in the last three years and now with the with the wuhan virus the term wuhan virus given by president trump that seems to have hit china's image and self-esteem in a very big and china is now coming out um, now with a thing called wolf warrior diplomacy a terminology called wolf warrior diplomacy which means don't hold back hit back whoever talking ill about china here and there hit back at right i don't think it's going to get china anywhere but that is a typical response of a communist state that when you are under pressure of this kind when you are under pressure of this kind then just hit back so a lot of issues on india the world health organization so how far will china go in this wolf um kind of wolf warfare kind of diplomacy how fast will it go and that seems to be very evident from the fact that they surprised us a few weeks ago almost a month ago uh i won't say the surprise is completely something which happens every summer um uh, but uh, I think they did it a little earlier than usual, and they definitely uh, chose an area in which we expect them to do keep doing things. But the Galwan River area, where this has happened, uh, we have never seen a problem in the Galwan River area in the last many many years. 1962 was the last time that we had a major problem in Galwan. Never, never before that. Okay, the, an organization like the European Union is in a quandary. They really don't know which side to look. Uh, they are not entirely enamored by the Americans. They are not enamored by the Chinese completely, but the Chinese are the ones who came to their support. When it came to the medical crisis, Italy, Germany, all these countries have received tremendous amount of medical equipment from China. Much of it has been thrown out also over the bridge of cost because there's been a, a, lot of, a, a, a lot of rot which has been sent to them. But uh, you'll be surprised that in certain places, the goods which were received uh, at the at the uh, at the airports in the in the huge uh, uh, cargo flights, uh, they were received with the much fanfare, the flag of China being put up along with the flag of uh, Italy and things like that. Now, nations who have been helped in crisis situations don't forget, and that is why I anticipate that the European Union will not be entirely with the United States tomorrow. In, in 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 this supposed war uh, against uh, or in any way war against china in any way medical and supply chain management will be a major economic consideration you can 132 countries have come together against china and in the world health organization that's fine that's one domain but when it comes back to feeding 
mouths. People are all looking at the supply chain. People are looking for jobs. And uh, the supply chain goes back to China. It goes back to Shanghai. It goes back to Shenzhen and places like that. From where the manufacturing is all coming in. So, uh, so many spares are being, being made there. So many parts are being made there. Many things are being assembled in India and other countries which are coming in from there. Mobiles, the amount of mobiles which are being made here uh, based upon parts which are manufactured in China. One thing which is definitely going to happen is a shift which is going to take place to the Indo-Pacific. It used to be, if you remember, called the Asia-Pacific earlier. Now it's called the Indo-Pacific. This shift is decidedly going to happen. For the last uh, 30 years after the Second World, after the, after the Cold War, the um, Americans have been trying their best to actually focus on the Indo-Pacific or the Asia-Pacific. But each time that they tried to bring this focus, they were pulled back by events which were there in either Middle East or in South Asia, like in Afghanistan. And therefore, the focus always had to remain there in the energy belt or in uh, Central Asia and Afghanistan and places like that. Now it seems the Americans are going to be hell-bent to shift this whole thing to the Indo-Pacific because the Chinese are going to get very, very energetic about exercising their supposed rights um, on the territories that they claim the entire South China Sea, all the islands of the South China Sea and places like that. And the West, I think West Asia is going to have a temporary reprieve. Temporary. Uh, when a region such as West Asia has a economic downturn, which is bound to happen because of the low energy prices, uh, trading coming down to a lower levels, you want to find a loss of jobs, you want to find a lot of retrenchment, a lot of Indians are going to come back, so many Pakistanis are going to come back from there, they are going to lose many billion dollars worth of remittances. The effect, the security effect of all this in West Asia is going to be you're going to find that many more unemployed people. And uh, you've already had a major problem of terrorism here. You've had a major problem of radicalization here. I don't see the end of that taking place anytime too soon. So uh, I did think I did not explain to you the term balance of power. I think, uh, one second, I did I? Yeah, I, before I come here, balance of power is a very important terminology in which uh, uh, what you have to remember is that essentially the new world order is based upon that. Uh, it depends on which part ge geopolitically and geostrategically, which part of the world is dominated by whom. What resources exist in that part of the world. After most of the domination that nations do is for the purpose of either resources or for the purpose of routes of transportation. So a lot will depend on this. No, just remember, I can I only emphasize on India. India's geostrategic location in the Indian Ocean, sitting at the crown of the Indian Ocean, actually makes it dictate, if it wants to, makes it dictate the control of the sea lines of communication through the Indian Ocean. And this is the busiest sea lines of communication in the world. 70 to 75 percent of the world's trade takes place through these routes. So in the, in, the, in the emerging balance of power, India can definitely look towards making sure that it has the relevant ability to play a major role. And that can only happen if the Indian Navy really comes of age. Because so far we've had so much of emphasis on the army, and I'm an army man myself, coming from me, I can tell you the age of the Navy has really come today. And we have to look at it much more seriously. Okay. Yeah. What would be the effect on India? I think number one, a reappraisal of national security, which has to continue from time to time. We are one country which uh, has not written a national security document. We need, to, we need to write something down. We need to put it down for greater clarity for our intellectual community, for everyone in the, in the, in the country. What, are our, what is our intent? What are our aspirations? How do we intend to, um, to, to reach these aspirations? Of all this needs to be put down on paper. Um, recovery of economy is going to be our major, major emphasis. Resetting of strategic partnerships, particularly the Indo-US strategic partnership, which uh, 
always promises to come up to a point and then takes a few steps back. Uh, you had this 2 plus 2 dialogue, which has gone on for two years, and then suddenly took a back step, appeared to have taken a back step. Uh, President Trump has come in uninvited first and then subsequently invited. Uh, President Trump has tried to intervene on the Kashmir issue, uninvited at one stage. I mean, this whole aspect of greater trust has to be, has to be brought about. The Americans don't trust anyone, and particularly with their advanced technology. So if, if India has to benefit from it, then that trust has to be established. Whether we should be completely pro-US or should, should we shift to greater multilateralism? Remember, we got Russia no, over the northern borders. If we are looking at Gilgit Baltistan and aspirations for Gilgit Baltistan, north of that is Central Asia, north of that is all Russia. Central Asia has a huge Russian influence, also a Chinese influence. So by putting our eggs into the American basket, should we cut off all our ties with Russia, a country which uh, has a, which has a, supported us tremendously against the Pakistanis, against China in the past? That's the question. Of course, uh, this issue, of course, is covered in our subsequent bullet. The sign of Pakistan collusion will become a major threat. And what you are seeing in Ladakh is the beginning of that. It's the beginning of that. Uh, I mean, the, the, the Pakistanis haven't played too much of a role yet. Uh, they're playing a role quietly in the social media domain, in the information domain. And if you notice the cyber domain, a lot of articles from Pakistan are emerging on this. And there seems to be a reasonable understanding of what I can say. Look at Pakistani strategic literature. So this is going to be a major issue. Uh, I've already discussed the importance of Russia. The management of the diaspora, worldwide diaspora. India has got a huge diaspora worldwide. The diaspora has got very intensely disturbed. We had a diaspora in America, Russia, oh, no, sorry, in Australia, Singapore. Eight million of them in the Middle East. Uh, it's not going to be the same again. There's a lot of job losses taking place in the U.S. itself. How is this going to be managed? Because this has been one of our major strengths, the diaspora, and has contributed tremendously to our economy, to our reputation, to our linkages, to our networks, lots of things that they have contributed. Defense expenditure. The, the army chief of the CDS is already talking about 70%, which means 30% reduction in, in expended, defense expenditure. I can't even fathom this. We are already at 1.5%. And if you think of 30% reduction in that, you might as well not keep an army or an armed set of armed forces. I don't think we can even meet our revenue budgets with that. Uh, FDI in defense, we've gone up to 74% now for foreign direct investment. But I'm told the figures are last 20 years. The total foreign foreign direct investment that has taken place with continued change in policy, etc., is eight million, not even billion, eight million dollars. That's the, all the money which is which is coming. Clearly, this is a field in which a lot more will have to be done. Glad to see that someone like Prime Minister Modi is there who understands this. Otherwise, otherwise, you know, someone, if you have a leader who doesn't understand this domain, the linkage of defense with economy is a huge thing. And uh, we need to invest tremendously in modern technology and transformation of the uh, armed forces. If you are looking at theaterization of of the, the armed forces, the theater command system coming in, etc. We may we may have very very laudable aspirations, but unless you put your money where all this is, you nothing is really going to be achieved. So what the four domains for India? I think some I was reading somewhere. This is really actually borrowed knowledge. That the four domains for India, which really seem to be merging, are biotechnology. This is one place where India has done a lot, and probably will continue to. The second is a head start in manufacture. We got to take a head start. We got to get back in. We got to try and attract those uh, big players from the uh, from the uh, Chinese markets, from the Chinese manufacturing space, and try and get them here before the Indonesians, the Vietnamese, and the Filipinos, and all get them. And lots of them are already getting because they are already past the pandemic, and India is still not peaked yet. So we we are already slightly late. Um, we must regain our outsourcing markets. What is going to happen is, uh, although the Americans would, something like the Europe or America would, with their own economies down and with their 
own uh, uh, downturn in uh, employment, high unemployment figures, they would definitely like to retain these jobs. But can they afford them? That is the issue. India has the capability to offer them on a plate. And that is something that we need to look at very seriously. We, have, we are suffering a, a major problem of unemployment at the moment. This is where the competition is going to be uh, price-wise, I think cost-wise, I think India comes out the winner any day. Of course, sustainable development goals, the laudable goals that the UN has laid down, 17 of these goals. This is something towards which India must work. Um, clean fuel, uh, gender aspects and things like that. The, the entire social, gamut of social, of the social environment. After this, particularly after this crisis that we've had with the, the migrant labor, this is something the world will be looking at. Okay, so that, that brings me, I've, I've given you a hell of a lot of stuff on this, but uh, one thing before I really start the China factor, I must tell you is that uh, some very good literature on this comes out of both the United States, of course, from some of their very fine think tanks like the Rand Corporation, Carnegie and things like that. But equally, a tremendous amount of good strategic literature is coming out of Singapore. And uh, especially the Raja Ratnam School of International Studies, Nangyang University, the, in, the, in the, the Institute of South Asian Studies, of which Raja Mohan is the head, Raja Mohan from India, who writes in the Indian Express. So some, if you are really into this, then that's the place to access. A tremendous amount. What Singapore is very clear is that uh, all these years, it's been the presence of the United States, ever since particularly after 89, after the end of the Cold War, the emergence of a unipolar world. It has been the presence of the United States in uh, the Pacific region, which has made a huge difference to the Asian Tigers. And no one can deny this. There's no doubt about it. What is worrying everyone there is the China factor there and the same thing is worrying us here on our borders. So uh, will the Americans, will the United States be strong enough? And I, I claim that they are, they are very, very powerful uh, economically. There's been a bit of a downturn, but the American economy has the capability of bouncing back. You saw what happened after 2008. So these are, these are issues which will need to be kept in mind all the time. Uh, the China factor. And... Uh, in this, you can see on the right side is one, two, two great leaders of China. Xi Jinping is here. You can, you can see from my uh, pointing here, Xi Jinping. And the other one in a very typically uh, communist uh, uniform of that time is uh, Deng Xiaoping. He is the father of modern China, actually. We will talk about Deng Xiaoping and we go for the next 10 minutes or so. Okay. So, Let's refresh our memory. Lots of things have happened between China and India in the past. You need to join those dots if you really want to make sense of this entire thing. You just can't come to 2017 and say, Why were they doing it? You want to join a lot of dots of the past. So let's, let's, let's see some of these dots. Uh, 1949 to 1978. 1949 was the year of the Chinese Communist Revolution, the coming of Mao. And uh, they have established 2049 on the 100th anniversary. You remember the 19th Congress of the Chinese Communist Party has laid down that by the 100th year, China should be the preeminent nation of the world. That is very clearly laid down. And in the interim period, 2035, China should be able to defeat any forces of aggression against China. Which means primarily it is looking at the United States is looking at Japan, is looking at Taiwan, and some messages to India too. Then uh, in the 50s, to place the annexation of Tibet, uh, which is ultimately happened in 1959. And within three years, you had the border war with India, two years after the visit of Prime Minister Chow in Lai. Primarily a misunderstanding, I would say, more a lack of uh, a lack of geopolitical maturity on the part of the Indian leadership. Of that time, uh, a lack of understanding of our own military capability, and we should never make those mistakes again. And uh, all this happened on the border war, which India lost in that incident. That had a huge impact on India's self-esteem. 
and from there started the support to Pakistan and uh, a relationship, a creation of a relationship which is supposed to be higher than the skies and deeper than the oceans and it really came to a head in 1969 when uh, President uh, Nixon actually used the good services of Pakistan to make his visit, to may send uh, Henry Kissinger, his uh, that time his national security advisor, to Beijing, and that was the beginning of the of the Sino-U.S. Rela relationship, which led to finally the defeat of the Soviet Union. Uh, but this nexus, this support to Pakistan, has continued because China has always felt it is uh, of great advantage to China strategy. Uh, in the middle in 1967, a very interesting thing happened, and that was. Uh, the Nathula incident, and I was just reading this wonderful book. Let me try and show it to you. This wonderful book by, you know, uh, Prabal Das Gupta. It's an, a book exclusively on the Nathula conflict. Most people are unaware of Nathula. Nathula in 1967, within five years of the war, India gave a bloody nose to the Chinese at Nathula and Chola within one month of each other. Almost 300 to 350 Chinese were killed. We also lost a good 100 soldiers. Um, but a sense of determination was projected to China that India is not what India was in 1962. Tomorrow, the same thing may happen in, it may, may very well happen in Ladakh. The Chinese may not risk it. And this is an aspect, it is playing on their mind what happened in Nathula. Since Nathula, the only time that a shot has been fired was 1975. After that, from 75 till 2020, not one bullet has been fired on the Sino-Indian border. In 1979, the Karakoram Highway was constructed to Gilgit Baltistan by China, uh, by Pakistan giving them uh, illegally 5,000 square kilometers of the uh, Shaksgam Valley. It is still in their control. In 1978, they came out with the four modernizations. Four modernizations. This was the famous thing of uh, Deng Xiaoping. It was the end of the Mao era, the end of the Cultural Revolution, and the beginning of the modernization of China. Four modernizations. Very important if you have to understand China. First modernization was agriculture, self sufficiency Atman and Bata. China believes in the same. Number two was industrialization. Number three was technical education or technology, the development of technology. And the fourth was defense. They gave fourth priority to defense. And they said, let the first three things go through together. Then the defense will come up. Until then, China must exercise, uh, it, it must exercise its uh, control over the borders to make sure that there is no turbulence at the borders. So if you notice, the Chinese only came in sometime around 2004-05 that the military standoffs with India started. Uh, in the middle, you had the 1986-87 Sundaranchu incident in the time of Jan Sundarji. For six months, there was a standoff in Arunachal Pradesh, not a short fire. The Chinese tried to come and evict us from a particular area. They stood in front of us for six months. They stood there or rather deployed there and went back. From the shortest fire, India did not buckle down. All this is part of history, and therefore it's playing on the psyche of the, of the, of the, of the Chinese. 1989 was Tiananmen Square, which is actually today, which is the anniversary is today, the 5th of June. And this is a, it was, it was a huge, uh, this is always an image deficit for, for China. To remember that it killed a couple of hundred of its own young people who were protesting there. The same thing could very well happen to Hong Kong with the change of laws. 1990 started the phenomenal GDP growth. And China reached uh, the highest uh, GDP growth rate of 14% at one time. It was also the same time in 1997 that uh, George Fernandez made a um, statement about warning India that the actual adversary lay in China and not in Pakistan. George Fernandez was the first one who put it in black and white and stated it. In 1993, India signed a couple of border protocols with China. Uh, with those border, border protocols, we have had 20 meetings with China since then. But we have not been able to overcome. Of course, it was essentially a treaty of uh, 
peace and tranquility. So peace and tranquility by and large has remained because the shot has not been fired and no one has been killed. But a lot of people have got injured in fist fights and uh, with iron rods and stone throwing and things like that. They also adopted a new military doctrine in 1993. This doctrine was called war under informationized conditions. The Chinese were the first, very, very smartly, they were the first to observe the first Gulf War of 1990, the Americans against Iraq. They found the entry of CNN. They saw the digitization, decision making that the Americans were doing, and they realized that information was going to be the domain of the future. So they came out in three years on this doctrine called War Under Informationized Country. By 2003, they led to the adoption of a new military strategy. The, the um, high and low of this new military strategy is that it, go, it goes back to Sun Tzu's time, that it is better to try and win a conflict without fighting. That's win a war without fighting a war. So you see what you're doing in, in, in uh, Ladakh, everything is playing out from here. Win a war without fighting a war. Informationized conditions are the most important thing. You must have the deterrence with all your hard power capability. Your guns and your artillery and your everything should be there as deterrence. Don't use it. Only project that power. And use information, psychological warfare, media warfare, cyber warfare, legal warfare. Use all this to swamp your adversary, your enemy, and force him to his knees through that. This is what he's trying to do to you in Ladakh. Exactly what he's trying to do. He tried to do it in, in Doklam, did not succeed. But Doklam was also, at the end of the day, we have to remember, there was a BRICS standoff, uh, BRICS meeting which was coming. The China 19th Congress of the Chinese Communist Party was coming. China was in a bit of a hurry. It may have stayed on otherwise uh, in Doklam. Uh, is 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 um, what is taking place in the Galwan River? Is it Doklam too, which China is playing up against us? That's something for us to speculate. Okay. So 2003 to 2005, that's the time when the ramping of our military capability on the border started. And uh, the Chinese, uh, uh, I can tell you what, the biggest the biggest way to understand this is prior to this. In the Indian Army, when we used to talk about China's capability to come to war against India, we used to say we will get a we will get a warning of at least 18 months. Why? Because China could not bring into Tibet its forces uh, in one season. They had to bring it in two seasons. Seasons means in winter it's not possible to bring it into Tibet like that. So in summer, two summers it would take almost 18 months to bring your forces to battle. Today, in 2020, China can bring its forces to battle in a matter of 10 days. Construction of roads, construction of airfields all over, railways, infrastructure in such a way that on the flat, open, Tibetan plateau, everything can be brought to battle. Okay. And that is how LSE transgression started. Transgression is coming up to a point. To, on the line of actual control, which is claiming it. We'll talk about this in the next slide. 2013 to 2020, we have only seen military standoffs. We have seen informal summits. We have seen serious efforts by someone like Prime Minister Modi to actually come to terms with China on an equal footing. In no way have, as, as Mr. Modi ever attempted to try and do India down or show America, China in a very in a, in a position of, of much greater power. On, a, on very, very equal terms, he's tried to do this admirably. But so far, every time this, this seems to be taking a few steps back. So in India, what, what is really irking China is India's unrealized potential. The world knows that India has got tremendous potential. I mean, we can go to 10%, 11% growth. If we get our act together, get our infrastructure together, get rid of our corruption, get our bureaucratic procedures together, we can go to that kind of a thing. It may happen. It may happen. And it can happen under a leader like Prime Minister Modi himself. India's underlying potential is a major threat to China's ambitions. 
it only thinks long term. I'm sorry for that mistake. It only thinks long term. That India in 2035, 2040 may emerge to be a much greater power. And that is the time that it will challenge China. China must ensure that, that India does not reach that position of the eminence or the, 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 the gap between China and India must always be maintained in capability that China that India is not in a position to affect China's security. More than that, China does not want India to partner the United States, Japan particularly, two countries does not want to partner these two countries in strategic alliances, which can have an overbearing effect on China. Okay, these are the territorial disputes. We quickly just go over them, some of them. Now, this map is divided out. Don't take it as a, um, this is not really a political map. This is more a map of explanation. Um, this area, this is Gilgit, Baltistan. This is the area of, of 5,000 square kilometers, which has been seeded out by by Pakistan to China. Then there's the area claimed by China. This is the Aksai chain area, actually. This is the central sector area or the Himachal Pradesh border disputed areas. There's a small disputed area here in the area of uh, near Likhabali, this whole area with the China. The Nepalese have also come into this whole problem of um, uh, this, um, what is called the triangle here, the, getting the exact terminology for it. And then, of course, the whole McMahon line, which uh, uh, Professor Makran was talking about uh, Arunachal Pradesh and the Makran, uh, the, 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 the McMahon line. McMahon line came under the Shimla Agreement of 1914. And many people confuse the Shimla Agreement of 1914 with the Shimla Agreement of 1972, also, quite, quite often. This is just to give you a broad overview that there are problem areas right here. Here we have a problem. This is the Chumbi Valley area. This is where Doklam is. And you had this problem in, 19, in 2017, in particular. Okay, so what is China's strategy in the post-COVID period? It's currently smarting under what is called the Wuhan virus, which I said, got a huge image deficit, following what is called a wolf warrior diplomacy, and is setting up a new narrative for the post-COVID world. It is setting up this narrative by trying to send home messages to the world that China will, will come back fighting. And that it will it will safeguard its interests to the ultimate, which is what this whole issue of wolf warrior diplomacy is all about. There's a particular a counselor of the Chinese embassy in uh, Islamabad who took this whole thing on and has now become almost one of the top uh, spokesmen of the Chinese foreign ministry in, in Beijing. And he's the one who actually started this this very very vociferous kind of a social media. Uh, kind of a campaign on uh, Chinese interests. One of the things is overcoming the doc, uh, doc Lam against it. 2017, most people, we slept over Doc Lam and said Doc Lam was over, we learned our lessons. I think somewhere, I mean, media did make a mis bit of a mistake of trying to say that uh, it was a victory for India. Then remember, you don't have to necessarily say that. You know, it was a victory for no one. I spoke on the Singapore television, I remember, at the end of 2017, when this whole crisis uh, blew over. And they asked me very pointedly these questions. And I said, no victor, no vanquished. This is a question of equal partners. It's a question of maturity. Both countries agreed to go back. And that's what it is. Who won the, no one won a war. No one won a conflict. In fact, it was no conflict. Because not a fire, shot was fired anyway. I think sometimes we make major mistakes in the media doing these things and today itself i was seeing a very awkward article by someone who's put out this whole thing of uh, why china is afraid of with the strategy being used by uh, prime minister narendra modi i don't think this is the right time to start talking about this talk about it after you have achieved it maybe at the end of it and you have enough time to talk about the good prime minister what has he led how has he created the strategy etc but not at the time when your core commander is going to speak tomorrow to the regional commander, the, the autonomous region commander of uh, PLA tomorrow. You see, it just creates the wrong kind of uh, background for a person to start negotiations. Then, keeping India focused to the Himalayan front. The main threat for China is actually the Maritime Zone. 
But by doing all this, Stockland one day, Tumar one day, Galwan Valley the other day, something else in Narunachal, they will keep you focused to the, to the, now what, what is the meaning of the maritime? This is the problem. See, I don't know if you can see my uh, pointer. See, these are the roots. China's entire, entire economy is dependent on the manufacturing here along this coast. And from here, it comes to the South China Sea, comes here through the Straits of Malacca, like this, and goes after that to the Suez Canal, or it goes to Africa, or it goes to the Asian Indian markets, some of the South Asian markets, and all the oil which comes from the Gulf comes from here, like this. What the Chinese have always been afraid of is what is called the Malacca Syndrome. This is the Straits of Malacca, and uh, they feel that they are afraid, they, they feel that the Indian Navy can make use of the Andaman, Andaman and Nicobar Islands. The proximity of our ports out here and uh, block off the Chinese merchant traffic and the Chinese Navy here. This is what they are modernly scared of. Because uh, when uh, Deng Xiaoping gave out his priorities, one of the major mistakes Deng Xiaoping made was that he gave, put the Navy on the lowest priority. The Chinese Navy on the lowest price. As a result, today the Chinese Navy is nowhere in a position to compete against the United States. And in the future, the combination of the United States, Japan, Vietnam, India, United Kingdom, these navies for the next 30, 40 years are going to dominate. And this is what they are afraid of. So what the Chinese have done is one of the major things that they did was they looked for overland routes. And the overland route, one of them is the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. And they looked through the corridors through, through, through Myanmar out here. Then they looked at creating the maritime, new maritime silk road, Sri Lanka, Maldives, and all Seychelles, and all these islands. So, to make sure that India does not develop a strong navy, they must keep India concentrated here in the Himalayan belt. Keep creating a security situation for us here so that we continue every year to buy new artillery guns, more aircraft. Uh, raise more formations on the ground and don't raise a new navy or strengthen our navy. That's a very important thing. They are also worried by this Indian capability in Ladakh of the DBO road. 275 kilometers of that road made over a very treacherous camp a terrain in, in almost about uh, taken us 10 years constructing it. But because of that, we have the Karakoram, the area of that Karakoram at DBO is now in our, our control far more effective. And it is looking at collusion with Pakistan for the possibility of it creating a second of the Belt and Road Initiative through Ladakh. If it can get hold of CHN, if it can get hold of Dalat Bay Oldi, and therefore and bring its uh, footprint right up to the Shiok River, then it can then it can resolve. Then it can make sure that it has a new artery, a new arm being created for the pilot, for the Belt and Road Initiative. Therefore, China will not resolve the LSE. Nor will it delineate it. Difference, you remember, line of control with Pakistan is delineated, demarcated on ground through the Shimla Agreement of 1972. And the actual signing of this was done under what is called the Suchetrad Agreement of 1972. With China, since 1993, we have been on this job of border protocols and talks, but perceptions of the line of actual control remain different. And no steps have been taken by China to move beyond the first step of actually trying to delineate the LSE. If it does not delineate the LSE, it will always have the scope next year to come to Chumar, next year to come after that to come to Demchok and say, this is our LSE, and we say, no, this is our LSE. And the contest starts all over again. So, how will the standoff end in the dark? And I, and I said, it, it will not end uh, tomorrow. It's not going to end with. General Harinder Singh visiting there, it's going, to, it's going to take time to negotiate this out. The Chinese are, I think, this time a little more hell-bent. They have no pressures on their head at the moment. Um, they know we are under tremendous pressure. And they're being egged on a lot by the, by the Pakistanis uh, at the moment. Uh, I, think, uh, I think it will take a couple of more negotiations. And probably you will find an informal summit in which... Uh, uh, it is finally Prime Minister Modi who will who will probably create uh, the environment of a little more, greater stabilization.
what you will achieve in Ladakh is a temporary pullback. Although I'm not certain how ready will the Chinese be to pull back from any areas that they have occupied. The government of India and the Indian Army have not admitted anything and I will not even say a word on it. As long as the official position of India is that no ground has been occupied, there is always a possibility that the Indian Army has gone and occupied certain ground. I have no idea. I don't want to even talk about it. So, till then, I think the standoff will continue for some time. The only thing, danger that you have to be for guarding, guarding against is to make sure that someone doesn't make a mistake of firing a shot in anger, a life being lost. Because once that happens, then there is nothing to hold back. So I hope uh, I have been able to explain to you, I've taken an hour to do this. I've taken exactly an hour to do this. I've gone into very great detail in doing this. Uh, I think we are, in, as far as India is concerned, and for the China and Pakistan side is concerned, oh, we are, we can be rest assured that uh, things are not going to be peaceful for quite some time. Uh, all these dreams, this thing which we keep talking about, Gilgit Baltistan, of recapturing it, etc. Very good, we must continue speaking about it, we must continue putting the, the psychological pressure on the Pakistan side. But I dare say that the future, you will probably have this, how to do this in many more many non-military ways non what are called a non-traditional ways of uh, of uh, conflict rather than the conventional domain of conflict thank you very much thank you for listening thank you so much sir that was uh, a scintillating almost mesmerizing presentation it broadened our horizons i'm going to throw it open to discussions but i just wanted to make uh, very quick one or two observations. One is that uh, you were mentioning how our uh, border in Ladakh, in fact, out of 857 kilometers, only 368 kilometers have been demarcated. And uh, the rest of the LSE is, uh, in some ways, uh, um, you know, still, as you said, open to uh, some degree of fudging. And I was thinking of the letters between Zhao Enlai and Nehru going back to 1959, where Zhao Lai said, look, let's not bother to demarcate this. We will retreat some 10, 20 kilometers, you know, behind these lines. So I think you were, uh, you know, absolutely brilliant when you said how far the Chinese think into the future. In other words, the plan that Zhao Lai made in 59 of retreating supposedly, but actually advancing surreptitiously, is now bearing fruit because every year they may hassle us on some other finger, as it were, they may finger us some other way, you know, <laughs> so that, uh, as, as you said, and it's also very convenient what I was reading uh, in, uh, in foreign policy and some other journals, it's very convenient to divert attention just now from the, uh, you know, image battering that China has got uh, by, you know, pushing the, uh, as it were, the problem to the Indian border, you know, it's it's a good way to manage their own internal dissent. You know, the kinds of problems President Xi has been having in the Congress, uh, in the Communist Party. I beg your pardon, not Congress Party, <laughs> but <laughs> you know, uh, so uh, to manage that also. Uh, and uh, the only other thing I wanted to ask you was about this great book by uh, Robal Das Gupta that you mentioned, the 1967 Watershed. I was also going through it. And it would seem from the book that espionage and diplomacy played a huge role. You know? So I was going to ask you whether we are, uh, of course, these things can't be spoken of. We don't know what's happening behind the scenes. But uh, uh, have we ratcheted up our game, uh, especially given that in the weaponized information uh, uh, sort of war zone, the gray zone you talked about, we don't seem to be doing that well. I mean, Chinese tentacles are so deep into not just social media, but into the, you know, U.S. networks, the U.S. universities, uh, you know, the various uh, other groups, as you rightly said, in the European Union. And I think we are really far behind in the soft power uh, battlefield. So these were my two questions and also a little bit about Nepal, which you mentioned in, in passing. But you know, you, you've already talked about the nexus between China and Pakistan, you know, especially trying to get the Belt Road Initiative across the Karakoram right into the pa Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. 
And here we are being, uh, you know, pressurized by the Uri government in Nepal on the Kalapani and all of that. So I think in the neighborhood, we are not faring as well as, uh, you know, we might have. Thank you for those very, very well thought out and very provoking questions. Um, as far as, as, far as uh, the first one is concerned, I entirely agree with you, but um, my own study of this uh, new domain of warfare called Grezo is actually still at its very nascent stage. Well, I think this is an, an open-ended kind of a warfare in which uh, the Russians have involved themselves very, very seriously. And a lot of nations around the world are looking at the combination of political warfare along with intelligence operations along with social media, psychological warfare, cyber warfare, combine this whole thing with economic warfare. I mean, it's endless, the whole thing. In India, our biggest problem is our lack of a strategic culture. You see, uh, except for, why is it that every evening you're finding on television channels, uh, general officers of the Indian Army veterans mostly appearing? I'm glad to see that a lot of good young uh, researchers have come up suddenly, but they are not getting their space still, sufficient space. It's still the dominant military uh, commanders of the past who are still making most of the statements. Because the understanding of this conflict is not there, because we don't promote this kind of a study. I'm glad to see certain channels have done a lot of research work on it and things like that. And, and there's no doubt a lot of progress has been made. But I think we need to go miles before. I would ask anyone the question, who in India, which ministry or which organization is responsible for information warfare? Is it the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting? They don't know the backside of it. They know everything about information and broadcasting, but the domain of information is warfare. And I want to remind you, I think I spoke this when I came on the 1st of October, the Pakistanis raised this organization called the Inter-Services Public Relations, ISPR, in 1949. Which means someone there thought about information as a domain of warfare. And today you see how matured it is in the Pakistan, in, in, in the Pakistan um, security system. And they are actually supporting the Chinese in a very big way. The China, you know, when the Chinese try and play this into the Indian uh, domain, they, they can't do it because the English is so awful and, you know, things like that. Even they, even when they try and speak some Hindi, it is so, so bad. They used to call Indira Gandhi and in Inglanda Gandhi, you know, in that, kind, that kind of a thing. But the Pakistanis have come to their systems. You, if I find the maximum trolling which I find on, on uh, Twitter is from Pakistan. The moment they see my tweets in particular, they are immediately and I had to block 30, 40, 50 people in a day. Right? I'm playing my private uh, information warfare. Because I understand this quite well and I know that someone has to play it. Someone needs to play this. We should not make mistakes on this. And as I said, premature thing, things not thought through, uh, these kind of things written, uh, information, allegations, it is not to your advantage in any way, big way. Therefore, a thorough strategy, information strategy has to be thought about. The army is attempting to do fledgling steps, but I don't think they have the support and the backing which is sufficient yet, not from any other angle, but from the angle of understanding. It is not there sufficient. Second thing is about the LAC, LOC, which is again a very interesting aspect. And the army, you've understood it yourself very, very well, and you explained it so very well. I just want to explain to you that on the LOC, which is demarcated and uh, delineated, 100% of the LOC is being held by the Indian Army physically. And uh, troops and troops everywhere. We've got a counter infiltration role. We've got a, um, you know, um, mostly, mostly when you go as a commander on the LOC, they tell you that your task is to ensure the, the complete defense of the LOC. Not an inch can be lost. Right? And there's a principle on which we live there. It's called grabbers keepers. He who grabs keeps it. So it's a gunda gardi of the highest kind on the line of actual on the line of control. On the LEC is not this. On the LEC, as you said, Chavanla said, 30-40 kilometers we can be keep apart, then that is how we are. 
and that is why the lc has never been demarcated or delineated but today we are severely running into the into the potential and i only hope general harinder singh tomorrow has the prudence to make sure that we do not ever commit that we draw a line and we have to start putting our troops on that line because this 800 km line is going to eat up a lot of the army which we can't afford at, at this particular time right we can't have, afford to have this kind of a situation in ladakh because the chinese can come in anywhere or we can go in anywhere that so this kind of a warfare will continue but we can't have a situation of permanent deployment of troops forever through winter through winter you can imagine living in ladakh that's thank you sir thank you thank you very much now we will take a few questions uh, please raise your hand i see professor hitendra patel uh, go ahead unmute your mic and after you have asked the question kindly mute it back again thank yes. you yes yes uh, professor thank you yes. sir uh, thank you sir for giving us in one hour uh, an academician cannot manage even in two or three hours i mean it's a wonderful uh, introduction to the whole problem and its historical context is also very clear uh, i am a historian and uh, uh, i am not very informed about recent developments but i can only think of two or three things which connect to your overall presentation one thing which is very important is the way uh, chinese have planned it it's a long term plan and this plan is very very important and that kind of thinking is not seen in, in indian case now we have a prime minister which you think which is 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 thinking along uh, the lines which is necessary so that is uh, something which we can uh, be comfortable about one thing which is uh, reminding me uh, of the mistakes we had committed uh, during 59 to 62 when we thought that somehow they will not attack us and this kind of confidence that they ultimately will not come militarily against us was the reason behind uh, krishna menon and and nehru's utterances uh, an aggressive kind uh, at that time and that became an excuse for an excuse for chinese aggression uh, the literature suggests that i would like to draw your attention and and it is related to your own uh, very important observation that we are not ready for sharing it to the people intellectuals the real situation and i particularly like the way you put that uh, on doklam issue india was not the winner there was no vanquished and uh, our media did not have this kind of understanding and they informed or misinformed people that somehow india has scored over china and that was a mistake and this this these kind of mistakes can cost us very dearly so in this context are you suggesting that we should inform first and then uh, going back to what professor paranjpe had said earlier uh, earlier that in this kind of a situation when china is somewhat in a position bit vulnerable i would say in this kind of a situation india can think of putting some extra pressure because in in this entire uh, one hour session i i i found that tibet is is missing i mean tibet is tibet a dead issue now tibet is no longer figuring in any kind of uh, any kind of international um, forum uh, so to say but can we think of bringing back supposedly dead issue in this context so as to give us something to talk about historically to put china in a very in in, in somewhat defensive position because i'm thinking about what sardar patel has initially thought about and we uh, our government did not work along those lines and that is something which is part of history so we cannot go back to those days and and plan things but still as because we are putting lot of emphasis on information to the people or misinformation is dangerous can we think of putting tibet issue once again so as to make things uh, clearer to the people what is actually the situation what our mistakes were and what is at stake because people are not properly informed uh, listening your uh, this link one hour long 
uh, dis discussion, I thought that even uh, somebody like me is not very informed about it. Forget about the general leaders. So I would, uh, I, I would like to get your comment on that. Whether we can very go good. along those lines. An expected, an, an expected question, and I'm asked this question a lot by um, by television anchors every other day by many, various editors of the print media to put my views on this. That uh, have we lost territory? Uh, have the Chinese come inside our territory? And I, and I like to answer it in different ways. And uh, one of the ways is that uh, this is an ongoing situation. Uh, if you still, uh, it is a conflict situation, although there may not be an exchange of fire, but it is a conflict situation. In conflict situations, whoever takes the initiative normally gains ground initially. Uh, some loss of territory in terms of defensive operations will take place, but uh, there is no way that you can stop at this and not reclaim that territory or not ensure that you do not also claim some territory, some territory which is of an important, uh, in some important way, important to you, uh, you also capture that so that you have a bargaining tool in your, in your hand. Now, all this takes place in the in the process of while all these operations are going on. And uh, full transparency, I don't think anywhere, maybe where you have embedded journalists. In the Kargil war, you had embedded journalists, right? A few of them who went. You saw how Barkhadat has been castigated by the entire India has been castigating around this. And why did you reveal this? And why did you reveal that? And think that it made a difference. Uh, to the war fighting capability of the local unit there, etc. But do you want to do that again now? If you want, if you if you want to do that, we can go ahead and do it. We can have total transparency. We can put war journalists there who actually we really don't have war journalists in India, but we can put some good journalists there, have a look at the reality, think that, see, report back to India what is the truth. I don't I think the government of India is playing a very sensible game. I don't think there is a need at this time. Revelation of information may turn out to be more counterproductive for you. Do it at the end of this whole thing. It, I think there will be a there will be a conflict termination. There will be a termination to this whole that thing. Make sure that you are, make sure that you first of all um, record this correctly and then be very transparent with the, with the country. Speak to scholars, uh, speak to television and media and everything. But while the thing is going on, while it is going on in a remote part of the country like this. I, to my, my person, maybe it is my military upbringing, and I'm a second generation general. You got to remember my father was also a general. So I have a very militaristic mind. So I don't believe in this kind of thing. I feel that at the end of the day, what I want is that information which I want to put out or the information which is available to me should ultimately work to my favor and not against me. And in Kargil, it didn't happen that way. The Americans played information in a very different way in 1990, bringing CNN into the, you see, first of all, the mismatch between the United States Armed Forces and the Allies and the Iraqi Army was uh, 90 is to 10. So obviously, that's a completely different situation. But here, it's a very challenging situation and uh, politically for a government also, it's not a very easy thing to, to if some mistakes have been made, etc., then admission will come subsequently. But to my mind, I think it's being played out quite well so far. And um, and uh, the army has uh, probably taken necessary action. And at the end of the day, you will find an exchange with pro quo, etc., which will which will take place. The last point on this, you always look at, at appreciating what is the aim of your enemy. Because if the enemy has not been able to achieve his aim, then you can claim that you have won, okay? Then you can claim that you have won. In this case, the Chinese, probably the way I'm looking at it, the political aim of China is image recovery, number one, right? Strong messaging to India, you are second best against China, right? Don't, in these circumstances and these conditions, do not ally with the US and the Japan and Australia and the creation of the Quad don't do all this on your own. You are still very good. We will have our informal summits and India and China can live in peace. It is sending home a very strong messages on these things. Third thing, 
it is not it is supporting pakistan it is supporting pakistan as a part of a school system right it will not it will not go the whole hog but it is only create it, it has to it in some way it has to gratify for what pakistan has done for china in terms of um, giving out the china pakistan economic corridor I mean, of course chinese have invested so much money in it but now the stakes are going even higher right i think i did not mention 14 billion dollar uh, basha daima daima basha dam which is being created constructed in uh, in gilgit baltistan by china china stakes are going up hugely in gilgit baltistan so the china pakistan collusion has become that much higher so if the, these are the kind of aims that they have can you neutralize these aims can have you effectively neutralized these aims this will take time to analyze to come to and i'm sure the military men the political leaders etc are sitting together and doing these kind of things these little war games in the mind are being played out but at this time i think this much information is prudent enough thank you uh thank you sir in fact while you were speaking we had a hailstorm here in shambhala so oh. we are being, <laughs> we are being pelted with uh you know hail just now and it's become really chilly cold oh my so God. <laughs> But uh, we have a couple of questions. One is from Professor Chahel, who talks about, uh, you know, maintaining social harmony. One of the things you've highlighted in your slides as a part of pandemic management. And he's talking about the attacks on Northeast Indians within India, how we sort of, whatever you want to call us, you know, the mainland Indians sometimes uh, are very uh, racist towards our uh, you know, Northeastern brothers and sisters. And he's wondering whether, uh, you know, on the one hand, whether this is going to affect our standoff with China uh, by, uh, or will it affect our own social fabric if we have more such racist attacks? Or if China, I can add to what he was saying, if China uh, herself will try to exploit this, uh, you might say, fissure in our social fabric to its own advantage very very good question thank you thank you so much if you remember in the 60s and 70s when the Naxalite movement started in the 60s and when the original naga <coughs> movement started in nagaland the uh, sponsorship and support all came from china it was all considered the red support or communist support which is uh, coming to coming coming china's uh, the separatist way Somewhere down the line, particularly after 1967, after the Nathula incident, I've been reading on this a lot. Uh, we found we can't really peg a date, but China seems to have taken a step back through the 70s, maybe the 80s, and uh, even while even while the Red Corridor, uh, the Maoist incidency in the Red Corridor has been playing out, there doesn't seem to be too much uh, evidence of. Uh, Chinese financial support or Chinese sponsorship, etc. Yes, a couple of groups in the Northeast did go to Myanmar and from there to China and came back by that route. This used to keep happening in the 80s and uh, early 90s, but that also is something of the past. So China's role in separatist um, tendencies in India uh, has been comparatively low-key. That actually spells hope for the future. Uh, although ideally, Pakistan would have loved it if on one hand, if Pakistan plays China, plays Kashmir, plays Punjab, uh, and, and plays internal uh, Islamic uh, kind of a radical, uh, you know, issues within India, and the Chinese play Northeast, and the Chinese play Maoist Corridor or Red Corridor, it will create a mayhem in India. And uh, it is a part of what we perceive in our, in our appreciation of what you call the 2.5 front war. The two front war is one front is Pakistan, the second front is China, and the point five front is all this put together. That is the incidences in Northeast, the incidences in Central India, Jammu and Kashmir, put all this put together, the point five front, which requires uh, a tremendous amount of focus also while we are we are at work. So, but China doesn't seem to have been very active in this in this recent past. Uh, I would definitely not like to see China more active on this in any way. And I would not like to give China the reasons to do it. I think uh, I think an establishment of a little better relationship on army, etc., is all to our benefit from that side. 
But you are right from this angle that racism within India, communalism within India, has gone up many fold. There's no doubt about it. But at the same time, um, let me say, um, uh, as an army man, I mean, I love the Northeast. I love the Northeastern people. We just, most people, army people who live in Manipur, Nagaland, Tripura, Mizoram, they come back absolutely fascinated with that area, right? And with the people there. Wonderful people, absolutely. But um, the rest of the country does not understand it very easily. You see in the state, the way in Delhi, um, a lot of um, African people are, are, are treated. A lot of Northeasterners are treated here. You saw what happened in, in uh, Bangalore in 2011-12. Through social media, a scare, a rumor, and you found the flight of Northeasterners taking place out from there. These are very dangerous things that can happen with social media, with these kind of things with the hands of your adversaries. And we must not give a reason for it. So there has to be, as, as I usually very correctly said, Social harmony is one of the very important aspects of national security. You can keep the, having your development industries shooting up at any place. You can keep doing geopolitics and say, my position in the world hierarchy is you. But if your internal harmony is questionable, you are you, your, your power will always be questionable. Your comprehensive national power will always be questionable and your economy will never be able to reach its aspirational levels right therefore we have to play a lot of a lot of I, I think awareness on this is there but at the same time social media uneducated social media has come against us in a very very this is what i find every day contesting narratives on social media which i keep doing uh, while sitting in my car and being driven to office etc how do you explain it People have no idea. Today you'll be shocked. Uh, someone put a photograph of cherries, fruits from Kashmir. I'm sure you're eating cherries in Shimla on Twitter. And said, oh, wonderful. The first cherries of Kashmir. And I said, oh, my God, cherries I die for. And Kashmir, the heaven which produces cherries. Someone asked me, what is this fruit? I, I was a little shocked. You see, sitting in my, in my, this thing, I perceive that everyone knows what is a cherry. But no, it's not so. It's not so. Someone now knows it is not educated enough to know that this is a cherry. You've never seen it. So we should be aware of this. We should be aware of the huge mass difference intellectually, socially, economically, which exists in Indian society. And, and the more we work on this, that's why I think today's world is, is a world of a sociologist in India. Um, in the National Disaster Management Authority, I always keep emphasizing where is our psychosocialist? Uh, where is our psychosocial uh, expert? Because everything in a, in a disaster dwells around a psychosocial man. So, you know, it's a huge psychological effect on the minds of people, etc. This domain, the psychosocial domain, needs a re emphasis and a refocus. Thank you for asking that question. Uh, thank you, sir. Actually, it seems the question was from someone from the Northeast, Dr. Samson Kamai. There's now a question from. Uh, Professor C.K. Raju, go ahead. Uh, Professor Raju, unmute your mic and then mute it after you've asked your question. Thank you. Uh, very interesting talk, first of all. And Thank you, I think you explained it very nicely what uh, China's considerations are. The first time I have found such an explanation. Thank you very much for that. Now, my question, uh, some, uh, first of all, you're absolutely right about strategy. If strategic thinking is not there, you know, strategic thinking always wins over tactical thinking in my understanding. So let me go back to strategy uh, to recollect after the end of the Cold War. There was this talk of a unipolar world. And there was this talk of uh, soft power by the West, Huntington and so on. And that is still being played out in terms of what uh, Trump is doing because uh, the policies that he follows are not his personal idiosyncrasies. The policies are uh, exactly what has been recommended by Huntington, for example, immigration control. Now, I differ from you on the perception of what is happening in the United States. I think that uh, the issue of economic collapse is not like 2008, it is more like the Great Depression. Only way to get out of it would be to have a major war. 
And I don't see that happening because just as you said, social harmony, the very important aspect, extremely important aspect, and that is completely disturbed in the United States. It's not just the George Floyd part, there's a whole lot of simmering yeah. discontent. And this is a problem. And therefore, I think that uh, if you look at the symptoms, I think that the West is disintegrating. And it is partly to our advantage because I talk of decolonization. So if you are talking of decolonization, it is very helpful if the pressure from the West or, for example, the related issues, Huntington was talking about uh, civilizational conflict. So all this issue about Islamophobia comes from. So I think that some of these issues could be settled, and I agree with you that it is in our interest to have better neighborly relations. So I was wondering uh, whether uh, we are doing the right thing in siding with the United States, in siding with Japan, in siding with Australia. At such a moment, are we choosing the wrong master? That is one question. Second question that you said about uh, the issue of uh, oil prices, dollar linkages to oil prices. I think that China is definitely in a position to challenge that. Your Saddam Hussein, for him, it was not possible. He was too small a person to try and do it. Or Gaddafi was too small a person to try and do it. But China is in a position to do that. And China is in a position right now, particularly given the way oil prices have crashed. And if the dollar linkage is broken, then I think the US prosperity will be gone. So I think that that is, again, something which needs serious consideration in geopolitical. I would like your response to this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. On the, on the second question on the dollar parity and the use of <coughs> petrodollars, dollar as, a, as an international currency, uh, as the base currency, etc. Of course, your, you, what you have spoken is absolutely right, and I don't have too much of a comment to, to make on that. China is the only country at the moment in the world uh, which is in a position to be able to challenge it. Uh, they say 2025 is the time when China will probably come to uh, parity with the China, with the, with the uh, overall size of the US economy. 21 trillion, uh, they say by the time both are about 25 trillion dollars. That's what will happen. So China will definitely be in a position to do that. I have no, no disputes on that and I entirely agree. With that. More interesting is this issue of the Virtually the quad, which you talk about. Um, frankly, saying, I am a person who strongly believes in a very strong Indo-US strategy. There's no doubt about it. And uh, I believe in the Indo-US-Japan partnership. And after yesterday's virtual meeting between Prime Minister Modi and uh, Prime Minister Scott in uh, uh, Aust the Australian Prime Minister, I think. Uh, Things are moving in that in, in the right, right direction. The Australians have been very, very isolationist all this time. Uh, but now, suddenly, they seem to have puckered up and got their courage and uh, spoken up against China. Uh, they've even questioned China, the whole Wuhan thing. And the Chinese have actually threatened them and actually cut off certain items on trade from them. So it's not a very good situation which is going on between Australia and China uh, at the moment. Well, I mean, on the face of it, if you look at it, it's advantages to India, Indo, US, Japan, Australia, Quad, which works out both uh, not so much from the economic angle, but much more uh, from the from the security angle, naval naval um, uh, domination of the right correct areas, the zone zones which have been selected, etc. But having said that. Remember the Indo Pacific, it is the Pacific part is all with them. The Indian Indo part is only with us. Is with us. Good, very nice. Most of the assessments that I sat through with Indian diplomats of talking of conflicts and war fighting, almost every single ambassador who has been in these important countries tells me, push comes to shove. None of these going to countries are going to support India. They are not. No one going to come and fire a shot for you. Let me tell you that. So let's let's not let's not get into that. I think the Indian multilateralism or the multilateral approach has given us much better dividends. Okay, we bought a five billion dollar uh, uh, air defense system from Russia, cost us forty thousand crores. 
uh, the, China, the Americans were very peeved with that. But uh, the Russians are our northern, not our neighbors, but very important people in the north. You must remember the Russians on the side of the China, of the Pakistanis and with China and with them together can mean a lot of a lot of negativity for us. It's not something that is very positive for us, right? So instead of putting our eggs in one basket of um, Quad or Indo-US completely, continue playing this. Um, I'm not saying a non-aligned game. Non-alignment is no it, it, it doesn't give anyone any advantage. Playing multilaterals, right? Tissue-based, interest-based. After all, all nations of the world play their geopolitics based on their national interests. Why should we do it? So I would continue saying the the period post-COVID period is the is actually a completely gray zone in which taking strong decisions of taking sides here or there may not be entirely in your geopolitics. Thank you, sir. There are two questions which actually follow up on this one, which is that why shouldn't India be friendlier with China? You know, uh, both the questions, I mean, one question uh, from Professor Subramanian is that Indian infotech and Chinese manufacturing are so intertwined that you can't separate the two. And the other question is that in this fight between US and China, which might be uh, another Cold War in the making, why should India uh, side with uh, the US. I think you've already answered it. I've already answered the second one. Yeah, yeah multi multilateralism based on self interest is the way forward. So I think you have, but if you want to add something, please go ahead, sir. Not to that particular one, but I will uh, definitely add to the Sino Indian friendship, the aspect of friendly relations between India and China. I think I spoke, I did mention this whole aspect of uh, China's uh, great fear that uh, India sitting atop the Indian Ocean uh, seems to take ownership of the Indian Ocean. I remember, address, I don't know, Professor um, um, Makaran was there, were you there in Vietnam when you went to Vietnam yes. for that Indian Ocean yes. Conference? I was there, sir. I was there. Yeah. Yes. Now, in that Indian Ocean Conference, there was a Chinese scholar who had come from the National Defense University and he questioned this whole aspect of why does India call it the Indian Ocean? Because India doesn't have ownership of the Indian Ocean. And no one stood up, so I had to stand up and tell him that why do you take ownership of the South China Sea? It is not your sea. I said, these are historical names which have been given and therefore no one has the ownership of these oceans. Right? So somehow the Chinese tend to believe that the Indians own the Indian Ocean. And that uh, their shipping, which is which such a, a crucial thing for China's growth, is going to be always vulnerable uh, to Indian targeting. Why should that perception be there? Unless, unless we are, if, if you are part of the Indo-Pacific and become, yeah, part of the Indo-Pacific, no doubt. But if we become a over, overtly proactive part of the Quad, etc., we'll be forced into these kind of things. I think we need to make overtures to the Chinese to tell them, look here, it is for our prosperity. You do as much trade as you want. Take your energy through these areas. We are not interested in stopping you doing it. And let's have our trade. Let's let, let's be more cooperative on IT and on manufacturing together. Right? Our language skills, which is what gets us much more access inter internationally. But the Chinese seem to be very apprehensive of this. And they seem to be very apprehensive, as I said, in the beginning of the long term. India's unrealized aspirations and potential. They think India one day is going to rise to its true potential. And that day it will be an awkward customer to deal with. So why not try and maintain that distance? Keep that gap between India and China. And with that strategy, if you continue working, then uh, you, will, you will have cooperation between the two countries. But you will also have a lot of acrimony from time to time. That's the way I, I would do it. Thank uh, you. You did mention uh, BRICS. Uh, one second, Professor Raju. I think yeah. if somebody else has a question, we're almost running out of time now. And uh, please uh, raise your hand if you have a question. Otherwise, I, I wanted in the meanwhile for, for you, sir, to comment on the Nepal nexus with China, how Nepal 
seems to have gone into a kind of embrace of the dragon now and giving us a little bit of trouble there with uh, Kalapani and so forth. Okay. We lost out a lot in Sri Lanka. We lost out a lot in Maldives at the beginning of around 2013-14 and earlier with Hamban Tota at Sintra. Mercifully, uh, with some good foreign policy decisions, uh, we recovered ground in both Maldives and in Sri Lanka. We have done reasonably well with Bangladesh, but we really don't seem to be looking at anything great in the future. Because I don't know how much of, uh, of uh, cultivation we have done with the future leaderships of Bangladesh. As long as Sheikh Hasina is there, um, there's no doubt that we have, a, we have got a, a very strong relationship, which is going. Uh, this recent CAA and um, these issues have created some pinpricks with Bangladesh, which we will have to recover. Bhutan does not seem to be too much of a problem, but Bhutan is okay. I mean, we, after Doklam, also Bhutan has played ball with us in the right way. In fact, the best of relationship in South Asia are with Bhutan. <laughs> Myanmar has not done too badly. We are doing a good relationship with Myanmar. Nepal, why Nepal of all? They, of course, the Maoist influence, the Maoist government influence uh, has a lot to do with it. Right, has a lot to do with it. And uh, Nepal has to realize, it will realize it subsequently, that um, with India, it is a civilizational relationship. With China, it is nothing, it is, it is a relationship of convenience, a political relationship of convenience which is coming about at this moment. Right, uh, we have got a we got a civilizational relationship. We have Gorkha soldiers, thirty-five to forty thousand Gorkha soldiers serving in our army. We have got a huge set of pensioners. We've got a whole pension disbursing authority in Gorakhpur, which goes across to Pokhara, from where they do the complete disbursement. The Indian Embassy. We've got a whole wing in the Indian Embassy in Kathmandu, which does disbursal of pensions all over um, Nepal. So Nepal is opening up a, a, cap, a, a can of worms as far as these issues are concerned and not probably realizing it. They're looking at very short term, very short term games from this. And uh, one would never like to remind Nepal of a thing like this, but uh, I would not like to take it back to Rajiv Gandhi times of, uh, you know, virtual uh, lockdowns on, 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 uh, on Nepal, the manner it happened economically and things like that. But um, at the end of the day, we also got to realize that we have not treated Nepal too well. And we need to, we need to play up, not play up, but we need to reach out to Nepal much more effectively, far more effectively. It's not just at the political level, it has to be at different layers that we got to face, right? Uh, uh, you can't allow a, uh, uh, a special relationship of this kind, uh, if I can say it. This is the only Hindu country, otherwise, if you really see, how can you lose, how can you have a relationship lost with a country like that? So, to my mind, I think we have not played it from the soft part. very correctly identified by you, Professor Brantbe, that uh, from the soft part angle. And I go back to the same old issues, that um, in our perception and understanding of national security, soft power plays a very, very low-key role. For us, everything in national national security seems to be kinetics. It doesn't work that way. The world is quite different. It is a combination, and this combination has to change from time to time. With Nepal, there's no question of kinetics. It is all soft power. So, uh, I think we have made major mistakes in the past. We have not yet sufficiently focused on them, recovery, uh, recovering from them. And I hope that in the near future, you will find much more a focus on this. I hope the India Foundation has its uh, next uh, meeting at Kathmandu. I would love to go to Kathmandu and speak there among all of us. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. We've almost come to the end of our two-hour slot. I, uh, before I actually uh, deliver a vote of thanks, I, I also wanted to, you know, reflect uh, us to reflect on, you know. How empires, sometimes through overextension, uh, you know, lose their uh, capacity to dominate. Uh, do you yeah, think yeah. that China is at that critical inflection point 
where uh, you know they've got their tentacles into too many things and in you know uh, and do you think that they'll be able to handle you know for example the ROC Taiwan front uh, you know Taiwan is now emerging in a very strong manner in the on the world stage uh, after being sidelined uh, for such a long time Hong Kong may lose its preeminence in that part of the world as a free trade zone because of what's happening. Uh, do you think that, I mean, from Roman empires to the British empire, often empires weaken because they're overextending themselves and not able to handle all these various fronts. Do you think that that can be uh, one of the, uh, uh, you know, ways in which Chinese power might shrink a little bit through overextension and overambition? Thank you. Again, again, a very, very brilliant question. I... It happened in India many times also, if you saw. Different uh, dynasties, dynasties uh, overreach uh, into different parts of southern India, uh, centered actually in Delhi and uh, reaching out up to Madurai and beyond and places like that. It happened many times. In this case, so far the Chinese have not managed too badly, if you really look at it. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative has been uh, an important initiative, no doubt, but uh, obviously there is blowback taking place. Not too many countries are very happy with the terms and conditions under which uh, uh, this kind of assistance is being meted out to them. The loans which have been given out to them, there are no free lunches and things like that. So it is. A, I, I think there is a there is a level of blowback which is taking place, and the Chinese seem to, of course, the Chinese believe that they uh, come down in their economy to 6.5% and this time, of course, much lower than that, which will happen this year. They are strongly of the belief that they can continue generating manufacturing, probably take it to southern China into this area of Yunnan. You know, if you go to a city like Kunming or something so like that, brilliant. I mean, it's very beautifully laid out city. Uh, they, they can also probably get a much bigger industrial sector and continue to uh, manufacture as they are manufacturing in Shanghai or in Shenzhen uh, along the eastern coast. And with that, they hope to be able to become the, the uh, manufacturing uh, powerhouse of the world, which they already are, expand it much more than that and take it beyond, far beyond. I don't know how far that, that can last, how long that can last. It can get you, it can get you short term dividends, no doubt. It will get you short term dividends. You had two or two big, big, uh, BRI conferences in which a lot of people from Africa came and there. But you can see that the the enthusiasm with BRI is already running out. The BRI is being looked upon more as a strategic highway rather than an economic and social uh, highway in, in, in any way. And the moment a project of this kind starts gathering that perception, then people start shutting it. And people don't want to look at it. It's happened in, it's happened in Sri Lanka. Um, it's happened in Maldives already along the Mantine Silk Route, etc. So I tend to agree with you. But I don't yeah. think the Chinese are going to be pragmatic enough to understand this. I don't think so. I think uh, Xi Jinping is just too, he is just too ambitious and president for life and things like that. The kind of things that you have been hearing, which you have been doing all this time. A uh, bit of a megalomaniac. So you will find that his aspirations, etc., will continue to drive China, and uh, we don't know what will happen with this with this in supposed internal weakening which has taken place. We still don't know how much it has happened. Is this going to affect uh, Xi Jinping? Because a lot depends ultimately on the type of leader who who comes at the center. Because this is all uh, centered on the on the leadership. Uh, to, to my mind, there are no indicators that Xi has been weakened in, in any particular way. There is no indicator to say that Ladakh, what is happening, is an independent adventure of some general of the People's Liberation Army. No, it is not that. I think all is this to, is this is to a plan. So, I hope, well, I hope the overreach takes place and China's dilution starts, overall comprehensive national power. And that's the time when you will see the upsurge of India, India's comprehensive. Thank you. Sir. Last question to Professor Chahel, because I thought he had already asked it, but he hadn't. So last question to you, Professor Chahel, please make it really brief because we have run out of time. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I have a very brief question. So out of this discourse, 
but I think this is relevant. Sir, Professor Hasnan, may I ask you, what do, do you, uh, you know, see the future of communism as well or uh, democracy in China? Because uh, this future will, you know, matter in uh, Sino-Indian relations also. Okay. And uh, I have another question which uh, I have asked. Uh, I have asked to Professor Pranpe. Uh, Professor Pranpe, please check your uh, chats. Sir, one is enough now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, and I should, I should talk about democracy and communism. You see, first of all, China is a country with which uh, looking very far is, becomes extremely difficult. I won't even wager an attempt to try and look at uh, 2060, 2070, and things like that. Uh, there's no doubt that communism. And, and China was willing to compromise on some of the basic principles of all this, if you really look at it. Uh, the combination of various capitalist practices, ownership, etc., which was adopted um, after the after as a part of the four modernization, ultimately, which is what brought about the, the the whole revolution, the whole transformation of China has taken place because of that. that Russia didn't do it. The Russia could, didn't didn't um, sort of um, find it suitable enough to, enough to do it, they didn't have the leadership at that time to do it. China has done it and it didn't done it progressively. That is where you want to give uh, Deng Xiaoping tremendous credit for, for it. Having um, this desire for uh, liberalism, democracy, this, that, will definitely continue to play. There's no doubt. But memories of Tiananmen Square are also not going to go away. Hong Kong, you're seeing what's happening in Hong Kong and China is willing to well, virtually abrogate the 1997 agreement. If you really see the 1997 agreement doesn't exist today anymore. With what China is doing. Not even halfway have we gone till, um, uh, till 2047. So, I think China will stick to the rule of the Chinese Communist Party. That is what everything is based, the whole existence of China is based on that. And um, it will very strongly maybe very violently subjugate any attempts to bring in bring in liberal democracy uh, in, into 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 china you've seen what happened to the arab spring in the middle east liberal democracy will probably meet the same fate in china in fact we've seen Thank what they've done to the uyghurs how they've sent them exactly to yeah, yeah. And, uh, exactly it's terrible yeah. uh, anyhow sir thank you for your time and what can i say you are one of the Living Kohinoors of India, I mean, your <laughs> services to the nation and to uh, India are uh, really so remarkable. We are very proud of you, sir. We look forward to your visit again. And keep blessing us. We want to do well, too. And uh, thank you again very much. I don't want to take up more of your time. Thank you all for joining in today. Uh, we will try to edit this a little bit and then put it on our YouTube, if you don't mind, sir. Uh, with your permission, of course. Thank absolutely, you, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to everyone. Such nice. I mean, it's good to talk to intellectuals of this country. And all the intellectuals are there, I can see. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you.